direction. What will be your focus? What will you, what plans would you have to work with the other agencies such as the Interior Ministry to aim to curb this trafficking that ends up sending our young people abroad into unknown chapters? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, human trafficking, I know that this House has the Human Trafficking Act of 2005 that the Ministry is working with. We also have the Human Trafficking Prohibition Protection and Reintegration of Trafficked Persons Regulations of 2015, which are all legal frameworks within which to deal with the manis. Mr. Chair, when I get to the ministry, I will engage the Department of Human Trafficking, which I know exists, for proper briefing on matters relating to that. And then I can proceed on the right strategies and the right policies also to continue with what has already been talked as a ministry. Thank you. Thank you. My second question is on Hawking. Hawking. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure we are familiar with it on our street, especially in our main cities of Accra and, and Kumasi, and especially in the case of Accra. All you have to do is travel from Flagstaff House towards 37 Military Hospital. And there they are, Hawking, young people, some of the ladies with babies on their backs, young guys carrying, when they started, they used to hawk ice cream, chocolate. These days, they hawk everything, you know. And the issue really is, every time I drive around there and I see them charging on vehicles, I've asked myself, what is the position of the law in the event that a motorist mistakenly knocks one of these people down? What happens? How are they protected? How are motorists protected? Is there anything that we can do to keep these people off the streets to help keep them, keep motorists safe? What will you do as the Gender and Protection, uh, Social Protection Minister, if you get there, to help us deal with this phenomenon? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I share the concern of the Honourable Member, and I know that it's a problem for motorists, and not even for the motorists alone, also for the hawkers themselves. And you find out that most of them happen to be either young children who are on the street hawking. And it has a link with streetism as well. I know the Ministry has done some work on streetism and how to keep our children off the street. I will liaise with the appropriate committees that they set up and the work that they've done, abreast myself with it, and then proceed because I believe in continuity. On the issue of hawking, I think it overlaps with the Ministry of Labor and Employment as well. So when it comes to that, when people want to actually sell on the street, I think I will need some interministerial engagement also with that ministry. Thank you. Thank you. My final question is on school feeding. School feeding, beautiful government program of intervention to support kids in school, but lately it's been decked with a lot of problems. Our quality, the quality of the food, and the processes leading to contract awards, who gets what contract, who cooks the food. There's just a whole lot about it. What will you do if you, you become the minister to re-engineer this beautiful program so that Ghanaian kids, school-going children, can benefit from the real intentions of the implementation of this program? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I strongly the school feeding program as one of the social intervention or social protection programs has a purpose for which 
it was um, introduced, which is also to make sure that we have our children serve meals in school, hot meals, to keep them in school, more especially with the needy students. Mr. Chair, we must admit as a country that the intention and purpose for this scheme is good, but we have some lapses within it that we ought to look at as a nation and as a parliament and as the gender committee of parliament when I'm giving the nod I will engage this house and the committee as well to see how these lapses can be, um, can be streamlined properly. Be it NPP, NDC, we all have to accept that there are challenges. Sometimes there are intermediaries even in between the k which compromises even on the quality of food that has been served to these children, which is not the ultimate purpose for introducing the scheme. So when I'm giving the nod, I'll engage further and we'll all streamline things to make it better. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ari. Very well. Um, Mrs. Ari. Congratulations, Honorable Nomini. I've been reading an article and a research put together by the National Democratic International Affairs, Why Women in Politics, and their statistics show that women parliamentarians are great because it doesn't matter which political divide they come from, they come together to ensure that the welfare of women and children are catered for. Can you briefly give us the assurance that when we give you the nod, you will make sure that issues of leap expansion, affirmative actions, the laws that we need to pass are all done just briefly to give us the comfort that once you are giving the nod, you make sure that all these matters affecting women and children are taken care of. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I give my utmost assurance to the committee. Thank you. Finally, I wish you well. Go out there and make women proud. Go and make Akotoja in 2004 proud. And don't be minister for MPP women. Go there and be Ghana's minister for gender and social protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Karaba. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Adjust of I congratulate you on your nomination. Um, a quick one on uh, witches' caps. So, you have been briefed about the proliferation of witches' camps in the country. I have two witches' camps in my constituency. And it's, for me, a blot on the conscience of all of us that we still have something called witches' camp. What would you do about these witches' camps? And sometimes violations of the rights of these alleged witches. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, if I'm given the nod, what I will first do is to engage and visit some of the camps and engage these um, alleged witches. I will further engage um, the traditional leaders and opinion leaders in these areas to get a very clear picture of what indeed ought to be done. That is not to say that the ministry hasn't done anything. I have chanced my, I chanced on some documents which indicated that in Kambaga, which camp, for instance, there are 16, uh, 600 inmates. When they were engaged, only one was prepared to come back home. So I believe that a rebranding of these camps because as far as the women are concerned, 
they have found families in these camps. And so I will engage Chama, them Chama, further. Chama, would you enjoy that? Minister nominee, a rebranding of the camp, which is camp. So your policy will be to rebrand them. I know that... It has to do with, you have a background in human rights. It has to do with infractions of human rights that they are being held hostage because of some people's cultural and social beliefs. So when you use the word rebrand, are you going to promote uh, the detention of uh, supposed witches? Mr. Chair, definitely not. I indicated that uh, attempts to withdraw these women has proven difficult in the past. That is why I believe that another and a novel approach to dealing with the matter would be more prudent. So if they see it as homes and the ministry supports them with the necessary um, social amenities that is expected of a state, they are giving food, they are put on leap, and they are giving clothing. I believe that that negative branding at the witch camp will be taken away. And the women also, I intend to go through with them some education on the need for them to also know that these abusive methods on them are not legal and they can speak out and report to the police as need be. But I think the approach we've used in the past hasn't worked, and so I will look at a new approach, which is more collaborative. Thank you. Nilante, uh, you have been speaking to me. Please, um, what is your take on surrogacy, and what will you do to enhance or possibly eliminate it from our system? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I believe that surrogacy is um, a new area that we need to look at as a country and properly regulate it as such. Because in other Western worlds or advanced worlds, it's well regulated to the extent that every step of the procedure is legal and has to go through the proper processes. When we come here, we don't have that. So it will be an area that I will look at and I'll engage the honorable member. I don't think it should be cast out completely from our society because it is a novel and a more advanced scientific way of having women also be mothers in their natural way, if I'm allowed to use that word. And so I think if it's properly regulated, it will help us as a country. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, um, congratulations. And may I refer you to page 161 of our manifesto? And um, I'm sure you don't have a copy, but I'll read it. Okay. We will also, in line with our social development philosophy, ensure the enactment and operationalization of the aging bill, as well as the affirmative action bill. What are some of the things you would want to see in this proposed bill that you will be ushering into this house? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Chair, the aging bill and the affirmative action bill, if I'm given the nod, would be one thing that I would ensure that we get it passed. I know the affirmative action bill has been in and out of this house. Having been in this house and having engaged as a leader, I know that I can engage this house much better to ensure that this law is passed. The aging bill also is very important not to add on, but there are other bills also that I would be introducing 
into this house. So I think that what I personally will want to be seen in this law, these laws is not my priority. What I think should be our priority is that we are the representatives of the people. And as a house, when we propose and bring it on the floor, through debate and consideration, there will be additions and there will be deletions and make the law the best for all of us in this country. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I mentioned a name, Gisela. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable <laughs> nominee, congratulations. I just have a question for you on orphans and orphanages, and whether you think that the legal framework that has been established is adequate and contemporary for the orphanages that we have in the country today. I think that, I just want your view and what you think you could do to reform it if necessary and what practical steps you could take to make sure that the children that are in the orphanage, orphanages, even though they depend on charity and so on and so forth, they still have the framework that to protect them and their rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I would say that the existence of orphanages in our country has served numerous purposes for children who otherwise would have been on the streets. And these are usually run by humanitarians and philanthropists, charitable organizations. When I get to the ministry or when I'm given the nod, I will review the existing framework and see where we need to tighten up to make it more regulated, more modern, more human rights sensitive, and not be used as a tool to extort as well. So these are some of the things that when I get there and I'm briefed properly on the existing ones and the challenges, I'll be able to put forward the right strategy to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. My last question, uh, Honorable Nominee, what should we expect from you? Should you get a nod in four years, at the end of four years, in case your president does not reshuffle you? What should we expect <laughs> at the end of four years? Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable um, Chair. I. <laughs> The reshuffle part, okay. Mr. Chair, um, I would want to leave a legacy behind. And this legacy I want to leave behind is that the Almighty God uses me as a tool, like He used powerful women in the Bible, like Deborah, like Esther, to impact on the lives of many. This ministry is a ministry that is dealing with the most vulnerable in our societies. This opportunity will be an opportunity for me to impact on many lives positively as much as I can. And that is what I want to be remembered for. Thank you. Male, male lives as well, not female lives only. Thank you, Honorable. Um, All right. Wonderful. Uh, I'll go first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to, just to place on record that the nominee and I were mates at the law school, so I'd like to seize the opportunity to congratulate her. Congress, honorable nominee. My question has to do with um, LEAP, the Livelihood Empowerment Support um, Program. That program is a social protection um, policy which is um, designed to alleviate extreme poverty amongst our people. But the program has been faulted on grounds of the methods deployed in selecting beneficiaries. I'd like to know what you would do to inject some equity 
into the selection process when you get the nod. The last concern or an issue is what you intend to do to expand the policy to cover as many uh, of the people who fall below the poverty line as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, LEAP, as the Honorable Member rightly said, is a social protection tool. And what I would assure, what assurance I will give him is that when I get to the ministry, I know that there's a department for the Ghana National Housing Registry and they collate all data on beneficiaries who come under the LEAP program. If there's the need to enhance that data collection process, after the briefing, I will take that direction. And I would liaise also with the Ministry of um, Communication and Digitization to make sure that we go digital if it is not already gone digital because that is a way we can properly have people who are entitled to be on to be on thank you yes thank you chairman um I would want to find out what you would do to protect victims of crime. Um, in working in that area, we have realized that there are a lot of young females who are either raped or defiled, and at the point that they need support for either medical care, uh, sociological or psychological support, uh, it's very difficult for them. There are certain investigators who will demand money before uh, they take it to the clinic to do medicals and so on and so forth. Also, what happens is that um, in a practical situation where I have represented some victims, after the perpetrators have been convicted and sentenced, uh, the children are left with no protection whatsoever. What would you do as a gender and children protection minister in the protection of victims of violent crime. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. That's a very important matter that my colleague has um, touched on. Victims of rape and defilement, when I made the minister, I would make sure that the proper policies are put in place to ensure that the law is implemented. Because I know that we have the Domestic Violence Act, we have the Criminal Code, we have the Criminal Code which has been amended, and all these acts are acts of criminality. The issue of having a medical report even before you proceed with the rape matter in court usually deters even the victims from reporting because of their backgrounds as being vulnerable. So I believe that when I get to the ministry, some work has been done. I don't want to um, um, preempt anything, but I'm sure when I get there, I'll be properly briefed and then where it is now, we'll see how we can support with these um, payments. But I know that the law even states that even when the state has paid, there should be a way that the perpetrators will be fined even after their sentencing. So these are things that are sitting in our law books. And when I get there with the proper coordination and collaboration with the Ghana Police Service, I'm sure we'll be able to find a lasting solution. Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's this congratulations, and um, I'd like to ask you a very vexed but pertinent issue. I would like to know what your thoughts are on it. The property rights of spouses. Uh, the 1992 Constitution indicated that a law should be passed to protect the rights of spouses upon dissolution of marriage. It came to this House in the Sixth Parliament and was withdrawn for further consultations. It didn't make its way back in the Seventh Parliament. Would you take steps to address the issues that made it difficult for its passage in the Sixth Parliament and, and ensure that we make some headway to giving effect to the constitutional provision? And secondly, whether men should be encouraged to take paternity leave to assist their partners take care of newborn babies. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, want, I want to understand you. The men should take paternity leave. Yes. Paternity leave. They are women on maternity leave. Uh, I see. Yes, I don't know who for gender. Uh, uh, paternity leave to assist women in maternity leave. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I will start with the first question, which relates to Article 22 of the Constitution, which guarantees the right, um, property rights of spouses. And the fact that uh, this bill came before the floor, or came on the floor of Parliament and had to be withdrawn just as the affirmative action, there are a number of them that has come. I will give my honorable colleague the assurance that she, the whole house is expecting and the entire nation is expecting to hear that when I'm giving the nod, I would ensure that these laws are laid before the house relayed and for consideration and for the law to be passed. It is going to be one of my priorities. On the issue of paternity leave for men, I know that it's something that needs more engagement. Even at the mention of it here, I saw members, that our male counterparts, um, you know, re rejecting and resisting it. So I, I would open it up for further discussion but to place on record that I know it exists in other jurisdictions, like in Israel, I know that they, they have both paternity and maternity leave. But again, we have to regulate it so that the men will have to do, I have to prove that there, there's a newborn. Otherwise, they'll go doing other things. Thank you. I don't know why I got it. Yeah, it's very important. Thank you very much. Um, very simple questions about lesbians, gay, bisexual, and transgender. And to pick your humorized brains. Are they human? Should they enjoy human rights? And will you provide social protection? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the issue of LGBT is an issue that, when mentioned, um, it creates some controversy. But what I want to say is that our laws are clear on such practices. It makes it criminal. Section 104 of the Criminal Code prohibits one from having unnatural carnal knowledge with another person. So on the issue of its criminality, it is non-negotiable. 
on the issue of our cultural acceptance and norms to these practices are also frowned upon. And so for me, these are two distinct clarity on the matter. And th that is what I strongly stand for. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Just a follow up. Um, what our colleague wanted to know from you, yes, you've stated the position of the law, but social protection was an aspect you wanted your view on. The law is clear, no, no doubt. But the law is there, and social protection is another matter. He, he wants to know whether you have a view on that as well. Which part of social protection, if I may ask? The, the nominee has given his view, her view on the law, no doubt at all. But he wanted to know about the aspect of social protection, how you will react. Mr. Chair, do you wish to add anything, Honorable, to the answer you've given already? My answer, I think, has the utmost clarity of the intention for which it was spoken. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, that I will Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have only two questions for the nominee. The first one will derive from her previous role. I observe from page seven of the Honorable Nominee CV, she indicates that as Minister for Public Procurement, you were Chief Advisor to the President on procurement issues or matters. We have been on a campaign to find out details on the procurement processes leading to the airport $150 antigen test by Frontiers Healthcare Services Limited. Do you know the procurement processes involved and have you cited a contract so far as that airport antigen test con agreement is concerned? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, no, I haven't. You, you haven't seen the contract and you don't know the procurement processes to that, that that was used as a chief procurement advisor to the president. Mr. Chair, as chief procurement advisor to the president, I want to state on record that the Public Procurement Act Act 663 of 2003 was not changed during my tenure as Minister of State for Public Procurement. So the supervisory minister, which is clearly stated in the law, is the Minister for Finance. Thank you. Thank you. I want to come to social protection, which is the new portfolio. If God willing, this committee and the House approves your nomination, you will be in charge of. I am increasingly taking the view that this whole phenomenon of Kaya don't you think that the time has come for us as a country to just proscribe it, outlaw it? Uh, because it really borders on human rights. It's, it's very dehumanizing, and nobody deserves to go through what they do in this modern era carrying human load on your head. I mean, the human head is not for carrying load. And um, if you see their conditions and what happens to them, even at night, they have no place to sleep and all of that. Don't you think we should just outlaw it and then pursue alternative livelihood measures for those who are engaged in that in, in, inhumane 
you know, uh, activity, so that as a country uh, we can be more forward-looking and get this scar on our conscience off. It is a view I'm increasingly taking. What, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the issue of KIA, as raised by the Honorable Member, is an issue and continues to be an issue that we live with. To sit here and prefer my opinion whether or not we should scrap it completely and migrate them onto a social protection scheme, Mr. Mr. Chair, will be a hasty opinion for me. What I would indulge the committee is, as soon as I'm given the nod and I get to the ministry, I will study what previous works that has been done on the matter and consider the proposal by the Honorable Member and engage the entire House, including the Committee on Gender, to see how best collaboratively we can find a lasting solution to it. Thank you. Very well. Honorable Zini, very well. Yes, Reverend, then I'll come to leave. I'm grateful, Honorable Chair. Congratulations, Honorable Minister. That's it. There have been concerns expressed by caterers providing school feeding program on non-payment of arrears. Um, what would you do when given the nod to ensure that those concerns are addressed and also to even further expand the program to include um, less endowed areas who are yearning to benefit from the program? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I previously um, stated, I will reiterate it again. When I get to the ministry, I will look into these payments and the need for us to, again, streamline and tighten up certain things with, within that framework to make it better. And so I give the Honorable Member that assurance. Thank you. All right, leadership now. Honorable Deputy Leader. Okay. All right. Honorable Deputy Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Why are you introducing me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, the nominee, the former Deputy Leader of this House, the former Vice Chair of this Committee, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, on her grandma, I know she was recently blessed with a newborn baby. Uh, I don't want the baby to accuse to accuse us of keeping her long from taking food. I have a lot of concerns. I will discuss it with her. I will just wish her well. Thank you. Yes, Vice Chair. No question, my friend. Mr. Chair, um, in accord with his, with his pleasure, I will not depart from that part he has chosen. Thank you. Honorable Ranking Member. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, let me thank you and also use this opportunity to congratulate our colleague, the Honorable Sarah Adjuasa Fo, who is uh, transiting from Deputy Leader of the House to Minister Responsible for Gender and Related Matters. May I speak, I wish her well and trust that she would work to improve representation of women in public life in Ghana. But if I were to ask her, it's just for purposes of the record. When you go to Article 11, Article 174, Article 268, it all uses Parliament shall buy two tests, two tests. Maybe let me just read one for your purposes. I'll go to 11, Article 11 of the Constitution. 
and agrees with the indulgence of uh, Chair, I, I quote Article 11. It says, come into force at the expiration of 21 sitting days after being late, unless Parliament, before the expiration of the 21 days, announce the order, rule, or regulation by the votes of not less than two-thirds of all the members of Parliament. What's your legal arithmetic understanding of this? Mr. Chair, I, I would say that my, my mathematics is not that good, but two-thirds two -thirds of 275. <laughs> my arithmetic is really bad, Mr. Chair. But I, 91, I'm told. So, plus or minus 91. Um, plus or minus um, 91 is one third according to you take two your thirds time two thirds will be 91 two thirds of 275 or 275 yes yeah. Mr. Chair I have indicated my arithmetic is very <laughs> Chairman is noted Chairman my second question is Minister when you assume office across the country children have no access to play and recreational centers across the country, particularly in public schools. And lands dedicated for that purpose is not available. Part of the training of children and their socialization necessarily must include recreation. Would you provide policy leadership in that direction? Exactly, Mr. Chair, I will do that. I give the committee that assurance. Um, I know that recreation is another tool that can be used to enhance the well-being of our children, and not only children, the well-being of the aged as well. And when we all travel to the Western world, we see how they invest in parks, in um, recreational centers. So I strongly believe that already some work is being done in the ministry that I, when I get there, I'll be briefed and then continue from where they left off. But I strongly yeah, believe that every there. region should have at least a recreational facility, both for children and for the aged. There are concerns about nursing homes. And you've just given us an assurance but I want a definite assurance. Aged persons, many of them emotional distress, many of them sick, will you lead in providing for the first time in our history an aged bill which will take care of the emotional and social concerns of the elderly in Ghana? I'll do exactly that, Mr. Chair. I know that that bill um, it's one of the bills that has to be laid before the House. I will do exactly that. Thank you. Having been supervisory minister for procurement and noting that procurement is the most veritable source of corruption, what advice do you have if we have to improve our procurement regime or legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, if we want to improve on our legislation on procurement and our procurement practices as a country, I strongly believe that we should go the way the emerging economies are going, which is that procurement should be distinct and different and have a new outlook and legal framework, different from finance. Mr. Mr. Chair, all economies in the third world countries usually place procurement under finance. But finance itself, as a ministry or as a department, itself undertakes procurement. So it is like being a judge in your own court. So what is being happening now in advanced um, countries is that we are creating a new uh, ministry. I know it exists in Canada where procurement is giving a distinct function, a distinct expenditure to run 
so that all the checks and balances can be effectively undertaken. Thank you. Chairman, my last and the one is just a commentary to which my colleague will. The last is school feeding. The caterers across the country are very, very unhappy. They want assurance that they will be paid and paid on time. There are other schools, both rural and urban, that are still seeking to join that worthy initiative. What do you have to say to this? Mr. Chair, I give the committee my utmost assurance, like I did earlier, that we'll look into it and, be, and do the needful. Thank you. Chairman, I take it that our colleague is excited abandoning the legislative organ as deputy leader and want to have a new life in, in the executive to support the president in promoting gender and children affairs. Chairman, I know that in Ghana there is still underrepresentation of women because of our patriarchal nature as a society. She must accept the challenge and lead the process of social transformation. I wish you well and I congratulate you. Thank you, Thank you leader. Okay, Adra, you have stated on your CV, boldly, hometown, as I the quiet. Uh, you have declared it openly. Oh, I'm happy. And, you know, within the quiet municipality, there's a town called Kukufu. And there's a saying that Kukufu Bo, Kunu Enima, Empasiba. That, uh, so, today, my sister has come in. <laughs> you know, so, um, don't tell everybody, I'm asking you, our school feeding quantities. We'll discuss it later. <laughs> but more importantly, there's only one old people's home in Ghana. And it's, 80, it's, it's situated at the quiet. It needs some improvement, rehabilitation, uh, and support. I, I, it has become my personal charitable location. Uh, I want you to put it on your record that you pay attention to the old people's home at Berkwai, the only one in the country, and it is situated there. So take note, and let's pay attention to that. On that note, the other children's homes that need support, I'm sure you attend to them. And on that note, I congratulate you on your nomination and be assured that I have Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Let's I assure you. We'll support you. <laughs> but on that note, we thank you for attending upon the house. So those without me are the only ones. Yes, charged. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. If we continue like this, we can do another one, the country. Anyway, so thank you. Let's keep to the schedule we have started. We will we'll rest early. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, we will meet tomorrow.
I. I, Ignatius Bakowa. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Honorable Ignatius Balfour, you are a four time member of parliament. You are a former leader of this house. You've been an, a DCE. Oh, you are an MC, yes. A regional minister and a minister for labor. Now you're back and you've been nominated to the Ministry of Labor again. Is there anything more we must know apart from this critical thing? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, perhaps what I may have to add is that uh, you indicated I was a DC, but I was also an MC, and then I was a deputy uh, regional minister before becoming a regional minister. You started from this year and rose to become a regional minister and now minister of state. Yes. Right. Meteoric progression. Yes. Honorable Tanzani. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, unemployment in our country is becoming a security problem becoming so alarming, and so government try to create employment opportunity for the youth. The MPP government and the Namado, in their first term, try to introduce some job opportunities, which was called NAPCO. Mr. Chairman, any time government creates job opportunity, opportunities should be given to all the youth. But what I saw about this NAPCO employment opportunity was that recruitment mostly were done at the DC's office, and that people were asked to show their party affiliation before they were recruited. Honorable Nomi, don't you think that job opportunities must be created and given to all Ghanaians? Anytime government creates opportunities, all Ghanaian citizens must benefit, devoid of their party affiliation. Don't you think that we should move away from this partisan job uh, recruitment? so that opportunities can be given to all Ghanaians to benefit. As against, show your card before you are recruited. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, um, let me say that I get the idea behind the question, but when it comes to policy, NATCO is not directly under my ministry. So ideally, um, perhaps um, I would say that I should not be the one to respond to this question. But since he also added the general issue of um, persons looking for employment and they being asked to produce their party card, maybe I may have to come in at this juncture. What I do know about NAPCO is that um, when it was time for recruitment, they did advertise on the web. And uh, I, I have a difficulty to believe whether on the web only persons belonging to one particular political affiliation had access to that. Um, I, most of the recruitment were coordinated at the district assembly level, but I'm not aware of they being coordinated at the DCE's office. But that is why we are also opinion leaders within our communities. If 
uh, in case we find somebody in society abusing the law like this. That it behoves on us to be able to draw the authorities' attention to it, such that it is addressed. Um, the right to work is a must for everybody. You shouldn't belong to a particular political party before you should have the right to work. And uh, I think I will at any time condemn such an action, should it come to my notice. I, I am not aware of what the Honorable Member is talking of. Mr. Chairman, the nominee said that NAPO is not under him directly, but you were always reporting on the number of jobs NAPO has created any time you made a press. So why are you saying today that NAPO is not, I know that it's not directly under him, but you have been accounting for the number of jobs. So um, at any point in time, if you want such information, you can easily go to SNET and then they will provide you with that. No, I'm not talking about SNET or I want. You have, you have collected data. You have collected information which we are willing to provide this house. And I was talking about how you, you got them. And in the case of the public, you have shown how you were getting it. Are you saying that you normally pick this information from the private sector from SNIT data. Is that how you collect those data from the private sector? It's one of my prime source of information. But you know that that, will not, then that may not be accurate because you may have persons that have been engaged, that have been engaged by a company or a private uh, or any persons, but may not immediately start paying SNIT, sometimes years before that is done even though it's against the law. So if you are just using data from SNAP, don't you agree with me that it may not give you the most accurate information? I, I partly will agree with you, but that is the best we can have for the moment because the level of informality in the country is very high. Within the employment space, um, about, about 80% of work take place within the informal space. And that is the place where we do not have much information. Um, somebody may, you, you may complete school with somebody in the same year. You may decide to work within the public space. So perhaps you end up being, say, a teacher. Your records can be traced to where you work. But that person, then decides that, no, I have a family business. I want to be engaged in that family business. Before you know, um, just like you rightly observe, because it's a family business, all such contributions are not done. So information on that person just gets lost immediately the person leaves school. So these are some of the difficulties we have. Um, I must admit that um, uh, the, the information we turn out may not be 100% accurate, but I must also admit that it is very closely accurate. Mr. Chairman, is, is he, having stayed there for four years, is there any plan to develop a system that will enable you to capture more accurate information, especially from the private sector, in terms of job loss and job gains? people gaining job or people losing job. Honorable Chair, I thought this is about the third time I'm answering the same question. Okay, if you've answered it, then that's fine. Let me just find out, you, you spoke at length about the job that has been created by the economy over this period, both public and private. But when it came to the lost, especially within the banking sector, you said you didn't really have uh, graphs on it. Can you tell me why are you not also interested in counting the number of jobs that have been lost, just as you are counting the jobs gain? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, oftentimes, um, we are asked, what is the population of Ghana? And the answer is, that, oh, we are about 30 million. How late do we talk of those that have also lost uh, their lives within the accounting period? It depends on what you're looking for, but I, I agree that um, um, even 
with, 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 with the dog. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying so with reference to the question which was posed by the Honorable Member for National Um Oftentimes, we look at the net figures, leaving out um, what actually was added on and what actually was left. Because at any point in time, you will have some persons doing employment and other persons either retiring or leaving. And then we also even have those who will be changing jobs in the process. So um, at any point in time, you can't have some people leaving the net. But I, I, I think that for the purposes of our discussions, um, what we needed most was um, turning out the figures as regards that which uh, has been the added on. But I have also earlier on made a promise to this house that I will look for that information and provide it. And because what we are going to provide this committee had to do with the collapse of the banking, the, yes. the banking sector. Yes. Yes. But you know that uh, in almost well organized economy, they do not only just talk about even people who have gained job or lost job, but they go to even talk about job migration. So job migration. Someone may be having a job today in the banking sector, tomorrow he chooses to move into maybe telecommunication. They track all those, the age bracket, the, 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 those who have retired, because it helps you in properly analyzing the job market. So I, will you promise this committee that as if it gets given the nod, you would develop a more comprehensive system within the ministry that will help us to have enough data for analysis instead of just we've created this job, we don't even know how many people have lost, we don't know how many people have gone on retirement. Will you try to do that to help the discussions on the job market? Honorable Chair, um, perhaps as I indicated earlier on, this, this is also going to be the fourth time this same question is coming up. I, I have made a commitment that uh, the skills and job project will seek to address some of these things. But even whilst waiting for that, you know, on, on, on annual basis, we produce this document and sometimes we distribute some to honorable members. Um, this contains a lot of information and some of the answers that we, we, we are looking for can be obtained from some of these things. But I must admit that uh, the only constraint with this is that sometimes it is only limited to uh, that which passes through our records. And as I indicated earlier on, we have a lot of happenings outside the formal record. But if I must agree, uh, we, you must agree with me that work takes place outside the formal uh, space too. So we need a system that will capture that as well. So I want to take my colleague, uh, the nominee to uh, Youth Employment Agency, the YEA, which was established by Act 887-2015. The staff there are supposed to be permanent staff, right? We have a combination of both, permanent and temporary. No, I'm talking about the staff of N, uh, 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 what do you call YEA. They are supposed to be permanent staff. We have some that are permanent, we have some that are temporary. Which ones are permanent and which ones are temporary? Yes, when, when, when you are engaged initially, you, your appointment will have to go through Public Services Commission for confirmation before you, you, you transform into a permanent worker. So until that is done, you will continue to be uh, a temporary staff. Yeah, but all those who have gone through the Public Service uh, Commission are permanent staff. To the best of my knowledge. Why was there a massive transfer of this permanent staff in 2017 across the country? Transfers sometimes are management tools. Come again. Transfers sometimes are management tools. It depends on what management requires of a particular worker. So uh, management, in their own wisdom, will decide that this person will be good 
working at this place or the other. But it was massive across the country. Is that normal? Well, I cannot think for management, but I think that, uh, as I indicated earlier on, I am convinced that transfers are management tools. Are you aware that when those transfers happen, the, those who were transferred were not given transfer grants? It has not come to my notice. Will you investigate this and get the next actions to be taken? If, if within the uh, uh, conditions of service, such persons merit transfer grants, why not? It should be paid to them. But if it is not something within their condition of service, then perhaps we have to also be very careful not to implant something which is already not in, in the organization's scheme. Now, could you imagine uh, transferring someone, say, from Accra to Boga, and you could imagine that it will not be part of the condition of service for that person to be paid transfer grant? No, that's what I'm saying. Now, unfortunately, um, this, this, this is... Uh, an agency-related issue. Yes, I have a supervisory role so far as the agency is concerned, but I might not be privy to any every minute thing in their condition of service. But as I indicated, if it is within their condition of service, then they should be paid such sums. So you you see to that. You see to that if, Honorable if member, it is in their condition. Chair, I have earlier on made a commitment that if indeed it is in their condition of service, then they marry No, I will, I will make, I will, if, if it comes to me, I will make sure that it is you now. I'm telling you, and I was seeking your indulgence whether you will see to it honorable, if it is... Honorable member, you are not a petitioner, so to speak. You don't have the capacity to petition. So those who brought it, you tell them to petition him. Now, Mr. Chairman, that is the, one of the essence of this virtue, to draw nominees' attention to some of the things that are happening so that they could take steps I, I to get I don't disagree with you, except that when it comes to seeking personal intervention, then the person must apply personally. We draw his attention. Now, the, when it's brought to him, he is aware of it, that they have to make a personal intervention. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee, why was it necessary to suspend the Condition of service for the YEA staff. The air condition of service being suspended? You are not aware? No. Will you find out whether that truly happened? Just like any other working group, I am a head of sector. The sector seeks first the welfare of workers. So if, if indeed they bring it to my attention, I, I don't see why I will sit down on it. I, I will have to probe into it to find out what, why it's been suspended. I, I, I will have a very big difficulty uh, accepting that because, um, you, you know, as a ministry, one of our core values is to make sure that um, workers enjoy what we call decent work attributes. And one of the uh, 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 pillars of decent work is to afford workers the right to negotiate. So uh, I'm surprised you telling me that um, their condition of service have been suspended. I will find out. I will certainly find out. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee why it became very necessary to recruit project assistants across the country to take over the duties of district uh, directors and regional directors, and some directors even at the national headquarters. Project assistant of what? Project assistants were recruited in 2017 2018. That took over the jobs or the, the, the responsibilities of district managers, regional managers, and some directors at the headquarters. And I'm wondering why was it necessary? No, I, to do I that? want clarification. Regional managers of what? Regional managers of uh, youth employment agencies and the district directors and some directors at the headquarters, project assistants were recruited. That took over the duties that they were, the, 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 what do you call it, the duties that they were performing. And I was asking, why did it become necessary for the agency to do this by recruiting project assistants to take over the duties of existing staff? Well, I, I have to uh, 
confess that this, this is news to me because I do know in my district, I, I go there every day and I, I see the district officer there. And what you say? You go to your district every day? <laughs> no, I, I'm using it um, in, 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 in. You're suggesting any time you go there? Yes, I'm, I'm using it figuratively. But what I'm trying to say is that my district officer is always at post, and any time I ask of information, um, I don't get any indication that he's not in a position to give me that information because somebody else has to do that. So, so this is uh, news to me. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the uh, nominee these project assistants that were recruited, why are they on contract? Why are they on contract? I have indicated to you earlier on that if somebody is recruited and that person's appointment is yet to be approved by the Public Services Commission, then certainly that, that person will be on contract. It is only after confirmation from Public Services Commission that the person then becomes a full-time employee. How long does it take between recruiting persons to Public Service Commission before they get regularized? Ideally, it shouldn't be more than six months, but in practice, sometimes it, it, it goes beyond that, depending on the queue available. You know, the Public Services Commission has a lot of loads on their hands, and uh, uh, sometimes it takes quite a long time before some of these things are. Is it a normal practice that these new persons that have been engaged are put on contract, are put on salary levels higher than existing staff? I don't have any proof of that. Are you going to check? If you want me to check, I will. Are you aware that for the past four years, all the government announcements on salary increases have not been enjoyed by YEA staff? Well, I, 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 I cannot be privy to that because I'm, um, unlike public services, um, un, un, unlike um, other public institutions whose salaries are negotiated at the Public Sector Joint Negotiation Committee, uh, YEA is a subvented organization and they do so with their board. Um, so, um, Unless perhaps I inquire from the board, I would, I would not be in a position to know whether they've, they've had um, increment in size. But it is also not automatic. And I want to, I want, I want to be quite clear here that um, unless otherwise you are paying persons below the mi approved minimum wage, it is not automatic that any time the public sector uh, joint negotiating committee announces an increment in size, it is not that it, tra it translates automatically to any other organization. At the macro level, you may also have to engage your employees to negotiate. So if there is no opportunity at, la at that level to negotiate, then that one, I may not know about it. Otherwise, um, the, the local union will have to negotiate with um, the, the management and board for an upward adjustment of their salaries. And this one again to can I take your assurance that you you how can I take your assurance that it is something that you take up because for four years they might have lost a lot of value on their salary if they I, not receive any increase in salary. Chair, I, I wouldn't want to be micromanaging uh, them. That, that, that would be unprofessional on my part. I indicated that uh, they have a board that is responsible for their day-to-day -day management, and I will expect that there will be a good relationship between the board and uh, the workers. So if the board so deems it fit um, to sit down, and of course, automatically, if, it is, uh, if they request for negotiation, the board should be available. If Indeed, at the negotiation, there are difficulties. They can refer to the National Labor Commission.
for settlement should there be any disagreement among them? I know you you supervise the you supervise the agency and by law you are supposed to submit even their annual reports to parliament. And I also believe that you may have a mechanism of interacting with them periodically. Some does it weekly, some will do it monthly. So I'm raising these concerns that as you go, you ensure that the right things are being done there. Because equally, for four years, no staff of youth employment agency have been promoted. And all these are serious labor infractions, as you may know. And as a labor minister, there shouldn't be an agency under you with uh, what we call the staff going through this ordeal. Yeah, uh, the beauty of, of it all is that um, we have provisions in the Act whereby any infractions in labor can be addressed. And uh, if, if, if any of them is hearing me, and assuming what you are saying is also what is actually pertaining, then perhaps my advice, of course, as a minister, if they bring it to my attention, I, I can offer my advice. But I have indicated earlier on that it would not be right on my part to say that, oh, a board of uh, YEA, management of YEA, uh, by compulsion, you have to sit with your uh, workers and do A, B, C. I, I think that if the workers are convinced that their rights are not being uh, observed, they, they, can, they can resort to law and, and seek any other uh, privilege that they want to have. Mr. Chairman, very last question. Are you aware that some of the staff have no debts? Have no debts, no assigned job schedule? after their places were taken by these project assistants that were recruited, who are even yet to go to the Public Service Commission. Are you aware of this? Well, I, this is something you know. I, there's no way I will know about this, because um, uh, I, 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 this is something that I, is so I, loud I, within I, the any, uh, 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 year. Uh, Honourable member, why EA? Honourable member, surprised that the minister, vice member, minister, will say he has never heard this. Honourable member, I visit the national office and occasionally I visit some of the district office, but I have never, on any occasion, seen anybody not getting a desk to sit on. It may, it may happen. It is not everything I can see with my naked eye, but um, if that is the case, well, uh, it ought to be addressed, and I will urge um, the board to look at it. And you take keen interest in this? You take keen interest? I said I will urge them to work. The chairman, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, chairman, thank you very much. Honorable nominee, um, the banking sector crisis had effect on employment, no doubt. The government so far has paid over 22 billion Ghana cities to support those, not to support, to enable those who lost their investment to get it back. Some also had their deposits back into the accounts. Since this was a major issue for your sector as well, would you run us through the role your ministry played in ensuring that these Ghanaians who lost their investment had such a great relief, got 22 billion cities is no small money from the economy into uh, individuals who otherwise would have uh, been crying and suffering and getting traumatized. 